Hi, my name is Dan. I'm a former University of Birmingham undergraduate. I am not an academic like the majority of people are doing these talks. Hi, my name like is Dan. Astrophysicist. Birmingham undergraduate. Over the course of I am talk, not I'm an academic like the majority of people are doing these talks. Hi, my name is Dan. Astrophysicist. Birmingham undergraduate. Over the course I am towards it. Not an academic like the majority of people are doing these talks. Hi, my name is Dan. Go on a journey. So who am I? Like I said before, my name is Dan. I'm a former big name in physics of the Pointing Physical Society. Watch this space, I'll win it a third time. I am also a, quite a close friend of Astrosoc Committee. I've done quite a few talks on dark matter, arguably too many by this point. I liked dark matter enough over the course of those talks that I'm now a PhD student just starting in the University of Oxford, working on the LZ experiment, which I'm sure I'll be doing a talk on at some point soon enough here anyway. However, for the last couple of months I've been stuck with a much more pressing issue, which is not being able to go outside of the house. I feel like you might have been exposed to it too. So let's go a little bit into why. So there's this thing, you might have heard of it. It's called COVID-19. It's quite, it's, I think it's some kind of disease. Bats? Something to do with? It's something, something, China, some. Anyway, it's, it's keeping us all inside whatever this thing is, and there might be a second lockdown, and everyone's justifiably quite scared. And naturally, when we all get quite scared, you try and latch onto, like, someone to aspire towards, right? And if we're talking about people being stuck in a box for a very long time, one of the first groups that comes to mind is the astronaut. We all want to be one, that's why we joined AstroSoc. I was disappointed that I wouldn't get launched into space at some point or another. And they're all very cool people. Like, look at this guy, he's very cool. So how can we be as good as they are, obviously, at handling lockdown? Let's, let's just go and find out real quick. And that was kind of the thought process that led to me going on this little journey of discovery we're going to go on right now. So with that whole spiel out of the way, I'm going to go into a little bit of the previous research that I did, kind of going on from that idea, and some of the thought processes that were tinkering away in this head. And to spoil a little bit ahead, how those ideas really kind of fell short of what I was expecting. But first of all, we're objective people here, right? We're rational people. Most of us are from STEM, a few exceptions. So we like to put units on things, right? So how long is a COVID length of time? This might sound like a weird question. So I, I tried to... So we like to put units on things, COVID. right? Standardized so how long is COVID a COVID length of time? This might sound like a weird so question. So I, I tried to... So we like to put units on things, right? Standardized so how long is... Around 170 days. And by complete coincidence, really happy coincidence actually, the f typical space flight, according to NASA, is around 180 days. So I called this one sick. One sick is one lockdown that we've currently been in, and it is also one space flight. The first space flights by the third Skylab crew, we'll be getting back to Skylab later, was around 84 days, or a half a sick. But the longest ever space flight of around 438 days, thank you to Valery Polyakov for giving me a statistic like that by existing, is around 2.5 sick. To be a bit cynical, hello people from 2025 watching this video and laughing a lot. Uh, the days until a projected vaccine is currently projected to be around 12 months or too sick. So, putting cards on the table here, it's likely to be around one sick until measures begin to be lifted. If a second lockdown hits, which it, let's be fair, it probably is at this point. So with that in mind, the kind of lockdowns that we're going to see are quite comparable to the lockdowns astronauts have been through. So how do we try to not go mad? And on, on top of that, good job for surviving this far, by the way. Here's hoping for the second half. I should also add that I had nowhere to slot this in for reasons that will become very obvious later, but this is Paro, the robotic baby seal companion for the use of dealing with kind of PTSD, dementia, Alzheimer's, just anything that will result in increased levels of anxiety, and I've got to say, he would relax me a lot too. So fingers crossed that not only does he get used as they're discussing in future space flights, but also in everyone's houses, because I think we all need someone like Paro in our lives. So... The reason why I had to throw something like that in there is going to become quite obvious in a second, because I start looking up tips that astronauts have given to dealing with that kind of isolation. And you get things that are quite 
generic. You're getting like, set yourself a schedule and do things at a specific time every day to give your life purpose. Uh, be sure to talk to people in case you're not at some point or another. To make time for fun. You get, you're getting the gist by this point, I assume. Start a hobby, work out, manage conflict, look at the big picture. And while you're at it, eat your greens, brush your teeth before bed, and don't forget to tidy your room. Your mother really worries about you in this day and age. So I was going to focus on this as an idea, and it starts to get very gimmicky and generic and completely useless in terms of the information it was giving. Clearly, because these people were being interviewed and then there's kind of implications with being interviewed like that. But then I found one specific book. So most of this talk from this point onwards is stolen from the novel Psychology of Space Exploration, Contemporary Research in Historical Perspective, which is a really good read. It's also a stupidly long read. This book is trying to go into the psychology that needs to be in place within the next 10 to 20 years in order to get people to Mars. A trip which, I should add, will take either three sick to get there and back, or if you're looking at companies like SpaceX, is around infinity sick, because people will just be living there. So we're going to take this work, this work that seems quite relevant to us right now, chapter by chapter. And I'm going to slip in a few little items of personal research, a bit of experience here and there, but it's mostly going to be applying this single text to COVID. And if there's one thing to take away, if you leave right now, there's the idea that we have this kind of image of astronauts as being a beacon of physical and mental strength. It's how I started off this talk. But we do well to work out A, what that means, and B, the kind of effect it can have on these people. So with that, let's get into chapter one, which is called Psychology in the US Space Program by Harrison and Fielder. So this pair start this chapter looking at NASA's initial approach towards screening people. So this first of all starts out with physical tests, seeing how much people, people can bench, seeing if they'd be able to survive in a spaceship physically, and then goes into screening for particular traits that they believe will lead to people not being able to survive emotionally. So screening for what they'd call non-neurotypicals, people without a history of mental illness within the family. Also as people with short-sightedness are just immediately scratched out of, the, out of the equation. Anyone with anxiety? Gone. Bam. I'm very sorry. There's the quote attached to this that through most of NASA's existence, the behavioral sciences have been barely visible on the agency's horizon. Now, naturally, this changes because this quote is from around 1975. This sort of changes around the 70s and 80s for reasons we'll get to quite soon. But in general, there's this framing throughout the entire thing that NASA is picking people for the job and don't try and change the job for the people. And as we'll see soon, there's a track record of this going to repeatedly bite them in the ass. In terms of the psychology, not only is NASA not listening to the psychologists, but there's also the fact that uh, the psychologists aren't that well developed anyway. For a start, data is quite scarce. There's only so many astronauts that exist. At first, there was one. So samples are quite small. Though, as we'll see later, there are a number of situations that are, in fact, similar to a spaceship. You might even be able to name some right now. There's also the issue that NASA is quite privy with their data. By being an attachment of the US government, a lot of the data and statistics that they have are quite confidential in case of leaking to other people and the implications that that could bring. There's also the fact that even outside of NASA, this field that we're looking into, known as uh, salutogenesis, I've probably pronounced that incredibly wrong, is very untapped. When we think about uh, problems with a person, we tend to think of boils and bunions that we can just jab a needle into, rather than the fact that a person is anxious. And without getting too into the nitty gritty of this, it seems like at the same time, these issues are treated in the same manner. When we see someone with anxiety, we deal with it with tablets and going outside more and don't think about the circumstances that can lead to that as an issue. This is to an extent because most people aren't stressed, though I, I can't speak for everyone in that regard. Much less myself. So in general, not only is this field of psychology underdeveloped at this point, but NASA is ignoring what little information there is there, also because of the issue of paperwork. And it's quite convenient for them too, but it leads to quotes such as this coming out in the paper. So despite this, the 1987 panel's assessment of the importance of behavioral issues 
Little progress has been made transforming the recommendations for research on human behavior and performance in space into action. The history of space exploration has seen many instances of reduced energy levels, mood changes, poor interpersonal relations, faulty decision making, and lapses in memory and attention. These negative psychological reactions have yet to result in disaster, but this is no justification for ignoring problems that may have disastrous consequences. Furthermore, there are degrees of failure short of disaster and degrees of success short of perfection. If favorable organizational and environmental conditions can increase the level and probability of success, they are worthy of consideration. Which kind of sums it all up quite nicely there really, doesn't it? One of the big motivators that led to this statement in particular being made by officials at NASA was the increase in crew size in a lot of these ships. So, as you'd expect, an increase in the crew size leads to more social contact on board, and hey, it turns out that these people aren't doing their job perfectly, and some of them aren't quite mentally stable. This didn't really show itself in Project Mercury, one of the, fir one of the uh, first NASA projects, which just sent up one person into space, got them down, got them back alive enough to give interviews. This then gave away to two people in Gemini, three people with Apollo, and now we have around six people with the ISS. To link this back to how this book eventually gets to the idea of people going to Mars, we're expecting around groups of eight to end up on Mars missions. But this still results in a team, even a team this small, with a diverse set of skills. You've got kind of a hierarchy starting to show up, professionals are not so, and you've got a focus on communication skills and people personing and screening. Finally, after 10 to 20 years of this shite. There's also the fact on top of this that an increase in the amount of communication technology available in a ship also helps. Astronauts are now able to not just talk to the, uh, the eight nerds they're stuck with on a spacecraft, but they can also talk to people on Earth who aren't scientists, which is honestly great. But enough being cynical about my own field and probably most of yours as well, we should go on to uh, chapter two which goes into kind of the first ideas that I was talking about here about scanning and screening for very specific kinds of people. This is again by Harrison Fielder. So as we've gotten into before, psychology has been ignored for many years at the very start of NASA for the most famous uh, explorations and expeditions. And this is kind of because they proved that spaceflight didn't, prove, uh, didn't drive its candidates mad. Candidates went up into space, they came down, they were conscious enough to have an interview, and then NASA could just shove them in a cupboard somewhere to handle their emotional problems in their own time. The historian Roger Larnus points out that from the moment they were introduced to the public, America's kind of enthralled by this virtuous, no-nonsense, able and professional astronaut, this tough man who puts a human face on the grandest technological endeavor in history and represented the very best that we had to offer. So again, we have this idea of choosing the tough people and not changing methods to fit more people. So why were people convinced by this as an idea? Well, it's good for astronauts to think that they're the best of the best. The book describes it as being a, a John Wayne image. You, you see yourself as being a badass. It's gonna make you feel better when you get out of bed in the morning. It also cuts staff out, so it's good for NASA because why worry about what psychologists have to think when that's just more paperwork to have to deal with on a daily basis? And finally, it, it's good for the public as well. You can kind of lean on propaganda and help sway the public and the press away from potential criticism, because you've got to keep in mind as well that the first NASA expeditions weren't exactly done in a bubble, which is something we're going to get back to quite soon. But before we get to how this completely blew back in people's faces, I've got another neat quote here. So from the beginning, the press was never motivated to dig up dirt on the astronauts. Rather, reporters sought confirmation that they embodied America's deepest virtues. They wanted to demonstrate to their readers that the Mercury 7 strode the Earth as latter-day saviors, whose purity, coupled with noble deeds, would purge this land of the evils of communism by besting the Soviet Union on the world stage. Today, people look back longingly to a simpler era, when good was good and evil was evil, and at least in memory, heroes did not disappoint. Which is just, it's just such a nice image, right? It's a nice romantic image. So how did this go horribly, horribly wrong? Let's find out. 
So the first issue we get to is Apollo 7, the seventh Apollo mission. This is a real eye-opener for a lot of the people going on this flight. They meet cosmonauts on ship for the first time. One of the people who, the, the captain of this mission was Wally Shearer, who was a little bit miffed himself because of his friend burning alive in Apollo 1, which led to a number of people monitoring him, seeing him as, uh, seeing the safety of his crew as his prime concern will be tied. You'll see a very particular picture of some NASA higher-ups here. But anyway, this kind of culture shock of meeting the cosmonauts up there, seeing how they treated their staff, as well as him and his situation, led to, let's just say, some tension between him and staff, which was severe and public to the point where him and his crew never flew again. In fact, he did a lot of uh, sinus commercials after this. So Wally's off marketing headache relief, and at the same time, Skylab 4 is a mission that exists, Skylab being America's first proper space station. America are very proud of Skylab 4 at this time, and they're getting confident with their ability to get people up into space, so much so that they are, they've concluded that tough stuff doesn't need free time. So they start shortening meal times, they increase the speed of setup, worst of all, as we'll get to later, they don't give any of the astronauts time to watch Earth. This kind of comes to a head around the 27th of December, 1973. This is a quite a publicized incident, the Skylab 4 sit-down strike. Crew were noted as being irritable, hostile, grumpy, and arguably angry about overwork. This kind of came to a head in the form of the book Self-Care, Astronaut Care for Exploration Missions, kind of a watershed. At the same time, a lot of comments were coming out about about Mercury, which was considered a spam in the spam in a can mission. I always like that quote. So spam in a can in a corner. What do we learn from this? Well, we learn that the tough stuff mentality doesn't work, and it didn't work for the people who were considered tough stuff, who ended up in tense enough situations that they started to break down. So be emotionally open, realize that being strong isn't what gets you through lockdown, and also keep in touch with a lot of different people, because as soon as you start meeting some cosmonauts in real life, you might start to have a bit of a breakdown. Also, check with your landlord that your room won't kill you or set you on fire. That's probably a stress relief. So we've talked a lot about how things started to fail, but how are the psychologists doing at this time? And we're going to get into that with chapter three, Earth and Analogues to Space. The first chapter not written by the original pair, by Bishop instead. So as we got to before, sampling people in space is quite difficult because there aren't many of them. But it turns out there are some things on Earth that are like a spaceship. So I'd, I'd stick around and answer for questions, but I'm already going to be running over the time schedule by quite a lot. So we're going to go over a couple here. So deep sea divers. Yeah, they're, they're in quite isolated conditions, but they're bad to test with, because as the paper concludes, they're also in kind of the Navy industrial complex. They've still got this tough stuff mentality. So if you're wanting to work out ways to counteract that, they're a relatively bad group to deal with. Arctic explorers? Yeah, sounds pretty good. Most of them are physicists. They're not exactly, well, physicists and other groups like that who aren't exactly chosen for being tough stuff. I mean, I'm not exactly the strongest person in the world. Astrophysicists? Yeah, a lot of them sp were starting to spend a lot of time in places like Chile, having obs uh, observatories in places that had lower and lower levels of light pollution. So kind of watching them in isolation would be a good method of examining uh, similar circumstances to people in space. Canadians? Yeah, they're pretty tough. The paper goes to a length to conclude that just most Canadians live in isolated conditions, or at least isolated enough that they'd be useful, and I just find that quite funny. That leads to a couple of analogies for space exploration and isolation being put in different places on Earth to test for future adventures and expeditions. So from left to right, we've got MDRS, an experiment in Utah owned by the Mars Society. We've got the Horton Mars Project, which is located in Devon Island, Canada. FMARS, which is also located in Canada. A lot of desert areas in the Canada areas and Concordia Base, which is located in the Antarctic. All of these have been collecting data for God knows how long, but they're all quite promising as well, but they're collecting data quite slowly. 
These are large data sets that we need, and each cycle of people inside these ships is going to take around six months with some anomalies, which is it's going to be quite difficult. So hopefully these come out with results in time for future Mars missions, and at the very least, hopefully there's some findings that come out relatively soon that can help with missions in the meanwhile. Enough about astronauts, let's get to the bit you're all actually here for, taking pictures of space. Patterns and crew initiated photography of Earth from the ISS. And as you can see, researchers were a lot more interested than this one. So we've got Robinson, Slack, Alton, Trenchard, Willis, Baskin and Boyd, all different academics, all different universities, all very interested in taking pictures. You know what this chapter is about. You've already seen pictures of space. You're going to see pictures of space soon. Don't worry about that. But this is about what you'd expect. Though there are a couple of interesting quotes and a couple of interesting hypotheses. A crew member with a camera in hand was more likely to take self-initiated photos as well as requested images. Who would have thought that astronauts like taking pictures of space? More images would be taken before extraordinary events such as docking is also supported. It turns out that we can immediately conclude here that it's a good stress relief in those sorts of times. A couple of hypotheses weren't supported though. There weren't more self-initiated images taken on weekends, because I don't think astronauts really have weekends. Space is always a deadly place to be. There also weren't images taken of areas of personal interest. Astronauts found all of Earth to be quite an interesting place to be, which is something we'll get back to quite soon. However, we did see that images would be taken differently across uh, several missions, which kind of shows how this is a very good method of staying sane out there. I should add that this, paper, this book goes into huge amounts of detail about like focal length, all kinds of different conditions and hypothesis testing. This is a really good book. But anyway, here's some pictures of Earth. Ooh, we, yeah, I think you're kind of illegally required to put some nice pictures of Earth in most astrophysics presentations. We've also got a graph which makes this a scientific presentation. Here we see for large missions like EVA, for example, I don't know which one that is, if I'm honest, you see a very strong correlation towards the end of the mission with pictures being taken, though that's not to say that there aren't a lot of pictures being taken anyway. But this is what they used to support the hypothesis that in extraordinary missions, extraordinary circumstances, more and more pictures get taken, which is interesting. So that's chapters one through three, which are quite interesting chapters to get into. Chapter five goes into something which is a little bit less relevant for COVID, which is using flight simulation booths and testing. I don't think many people want to be in a COVID testing booth. <laughs> There's also uh, chapter six, seven and eight, which from different facets and points of view go into the idea that more diverse crews tend to make people happier. Shocking thought. Although it does interestingly conclude that from NASA's perspective, demographics are moving quicker than culture is so a lot of the older people in nasa aren't quite catching up to the times and they say that that needs to change before we get towards mars missions before we go on here's a uh, a picture of one of the spacecraft simulators Ooh, isn't that nice i'd want to live in one of those Anyway, anyway, so I've, I've kind of built this very morbid image of NASA up to this point. I go into these these books and these pieces of literature thinking that astronauts would be able to give us advice on how to deal with, uh, with isolation, and it turns out to kind of be the other way around. But this is the part of the uh, presentation where I'm supposed to tie this into something very inspiring, kind of build up this plan for how to deal with COVID and isolation. So I'm going to try and do that. <laughs> And to do that, I'm going to talk about Karl Marx. Please don't stop the video just yet. I'll, I'll get to the point. There's this play called Young Marx that I was watching during lockdown. And uh, in it, Marx and his family are making dinner one fine day. And he's making bacon and eggs, as you do. And he has this moment of revelation. So he turns around to his family and he says to them, I don't know who laid this egg. And it sounds like a surreal statement, right? Because like his kids are turning around to him like, what on earth are you on about, father? Restore the means of production to the workers, please. But he talks in some of his later texts, as well as in the play, about this idea of commodity fetishization. Commodity just being anything that can be bought and sold and is not just immediately consumed. But there's this idea that back in the days of yore, if you collected something from someone else, 
you knew exactly who made that thing, who produced that thing, who they passed it on to. And as we've started to reach later and later ages with the Industrial Revolution and going into capitalism as a more robust ideology, we've started to replace that more and more with everything having a price and more or less being a black box. And there's debates about like food standards and whatnot. But in general, it makes people feel less connected to other people through the things that they own, which is quite a negative thing. But astronauts managed to circumvent this a little bit by being connected to the technology, knowing the research that's gone into their work, by being able to contact their family, by being able to contact other people in NASA, and from just being able to look at Earth, this tiny blue speck in a moat of dust, and be like, that's everyone I've ever met, they kind of managed to circumvent this idea. They stop thinking of the things they're surrounded by as objects and start thinking about how they connect to the greater scheme of things. A lot of astrophysicists call this the overview effect, NASA does at least. The sensation of looking at Earth and seeing it as a pale blue dot, and at the same time, everyone you've ever been connected to. And the number of just things and people and objects and social connections through those objects that have made you where you are and who you are in space. It's a good thought. And this kind of wraps into what would have previously been a very cliche conclusion and kind of even matches some of the jokes I was making at the start of this, but it's kind of been made more robust now, which is that you don't need to be tough to make it in COVID. On, on the contrary, toughness mentality kind of ruined the first few American space missions, and we're only just starting to work around this as an issue. But we do find that keeping connected with other people and remaining emotionally open in tough times is key. So I'm going to kind of wrap this up with a couple of last little bits. First of all, there's two very nice quotes from the end of the book, which I, again, recommend a lot. The first of these is that effective behavior doesn't stem from good people. It's called forth from good environments. Surround yourself with good people. Make sure that you are comfortable and that you can open up to these people and you will survive. And on top of this, something to think about during the second lockdown is that it's not enough anymore to design to survive. The time has come to design to thrive. So with that being said, thank you for listening to all of this. I'm sorry if everything seemed quite clustered and hectic. It has been clustered and hectic in terms of starting the PhD and all of that. But thank you again to AstroSoc for allowing me along. I hope that I can do a talk that I might know something more about than experimental psychology at some point in the future, hopefully with the, the British Science Week or Space Week or whatever. But until then, uh, I hope this has given you something to really mull over, and I hope there's some questions. I'd like to talk about all this and uh, see how everyone's doing. So thank you. Cheers. And stay safe out there. We are live now. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, really, really good to see you all again. And hopefully you've uh, enjoyed that talk given by, by Dan. Um, it was really quite fascinating. Mm. And definitely not an area of, uh, of physics and, and of science, uh, per se, that we are um, normally introduced to and normally consider. Mm. Uh, but obviously, with, with everything that is going on in the world, perhaps it's something that we do need to spend that little bit of extra time uh, focusing on. Um, we're, we're really, really glad to obviously have Dan along. Uh, Dan's been a personal friend of the committee uh, for a number of years now um, and has actually given us uh, a, a few more talks in the past uh, and will be giving a few more talks in the future coming up as well as mm. part of our World's, um, World Science Week, World Space Week event even, uh, which is going to be in just over a week's time. So we are eternally grateful uh, to Dan. Uh, anyway, um, without further ado, uh, if we have any questions, we would really love to hear uh, from you. Uh, as always, if you wish to uh, come and join us in the, the Zoom chat, then you may ask your questions here. Uh, mm -hmm. Otherwise, we will also be, um, be monitoring the YouTube chat as well. Um, I promise we don't bite. Dan, Dan is, a, is super friendly um, and, and has worked right. with, with some kids from British Science Week as well. They didn't find him too intimidating, so I'm sure. There we go. Um, so we're looking at the YouTube chat, it does appear that we've had uh, more of a comment than a question, uh, mm. which is that you you uh, kind of missed out on submarines uh, in, in the talk and how uh, mm. pretty much that 
these people are also uh, slightly larger groups, perhaps, but groups of isolated people um, and probably share some some similar experiences. Mm. Um yeah, I mean, is, is there any other sort of big groups of people? I'm actually quite surprised that uh, a submarine type serviceman, uh, given that the US has probably got a large number of, of submarines, uh, weren't considered by NASA as a, hmm. as a potential test basis, test candidates. Well, at the very least, they weren't considered by this specific paper, though I, I do agree that there's definitely a gap in the market when it comes to further research in those conditions. The main reason to not immediately consider them is the issue that as soon as you actually work with people in submarines, you've got the exact same sampling issues that you have with a lot of astronauts at the very beginning of NASA. So kind of the idea of picking these very strong spe uh, specific type of people, which granted has its own merits if you've already got those sample of people who are in NASA to actually evaluate the uh, psychology of but if we're going at this from the perspective of if anyone can go to space we can alter the conditions out here so that anyone can feel comfortable then other avenues at least according to the not according to the researchers here they concluded that they would be better approaches to go for but i, I do agree that if we're looking for as much as many statistics as possible it would be quite useful to go into that at some point yeah, I think hmm. obviously that is very, very true. Um, yeah. You also mentioned, obviously, the there were four missions or four experiments that you mentioned uh, that were looking at the effects of isolation. Hmm. Uh, I know that there have been uh, a few others as well in, in some very remote places and some places that are the most akin to Mars that we can get. Hmm. Uh, again, often these desert locations. Um, I guess, obviously, you know, when we've got things like... Uh, groups of people up on the ISS this is forever helping increase our knowledge but what do you reckon might be the next steps going forwards for, for things like this? That's a good question uh, one of the conclusions that the paper seems to come to to an extent and I think I agree is it's it's difficult to predict what the following steps will be at the moment the best projections are to simply collect as, many, as much statistics as possible and kind of place a focus in terms of research into the psychology of these people, how they'll be able to mentally withstand. Because in, in general, psychology is a kind of field that is fairly untapped to an extent, at least compared to some of the harder sciences where we have much simpler conclusions, but the brain is still kind of a black box to an extent. That, that is a, obviously a very, very interesting point. And I guess... There is also a, that extent where although people may form uh, or conform to certain personality types, their own individual experiences, um, you, you know, throughout their lives will probably impact the way that an individual, any individual will uh, will react to a certain situation. Hmm. Uh, and that even if they are of the same personality type and are very similar people in general, a specific uh, instance of something may trigger a completely different reaction to one another. So I guess... Uh, presumably a lot of this testing has to be very individual and to a set team, meaning that the studies that are carried out can't necessarily be uh, forwarded on uh, per se to a future mission yeah. with a different team of people. It's true. Or, or at the very least, collecting enough statistics, which is going to take a, an absurd amount of time to be able to form these general patterns and relationships that we're so used to. But that's going to be a long way away, unfortunately. Well, it could be faster than we think. Like we say, there's there's a lot of nice facilities being built these days to test this more and more. It is, uh, it's certainly quite intriguing. Mm. Amrusha, do you, do you have any, any points on this? I was gonna mention that we have another comment on the YouTube chat and they've mentioned that the Americans did a lot of psychological testing and the Brits paid them seven pounds per day extra, which seemed to have solved the psychological problems. Would you have anything to add to that, Dan? I can see why being paid more to be up there in this spam in a can situation would make you psychologically more well adapted. That's my take on that, at least. Perfect. No, I completely agree with you on that as well. I mean, human psychology just has it that anytime we are rewarded, that just motivates us to work more, I guess. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> While we wait for further questions, I guess, on the chats or on the Zoom call, I'm probably going to start off with asking a couple of my own, if that's all right. Yeah, go for it. In terms of 
the future missions for Mars specifically, those are going to be longer term missions and the teams will be larger. So we're talking more people mm. in, working in a closer environment. And in such situations, what would be I mean, your main points that you would like perhaps suggest to have the changes made to the current system for training the astronauts? Like, How would the current research be different from the research that would be needed to obtain a sustainable Mars environment. So in terms of what the, the psychological differences there will be between just a mission to go there and back and actually staying there for good? Not permanently, like let's but say for, just for longer, really long term. Longer term. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be an interesting one, right? Because a lot of the research that's been going on at the moment has been to specifically fit the bill of, of shorter expeditions. Or because even with that sort of length, there's problems in terms of collecting the statistics that you'd need. In terms of uh, longer expeditions, the best case study we have is probably to an extent us right now, if we end up in a second lockdown. <laughs> I'd assume that looking into some of the ways of, of actually helping people psychologically adapt rather than helping them like handle the situation. So changing the way that we frame learning to cope within these situations would probably be the best way of managing with longer and longer term isolations. But apart from that, the data's scarce. I guess it's uh, probably quite intriguing that um, potentially for, for these longer term missions, you know, if, if uh, habit habitation on Mars, for instance, were, was hmm. to become a thing in the perhaps near future, um, I guess another consideration would be how not only um, friendships and working relationships would, would develop, but how perhaps uh, romantic relationships uh, hmm. and things like that might also further alter um, not only a, a working dynamic, but even potentially a power dynamic uh, within a, a group of perhaps a relatively small group of people. With an emission. Love could bloom out in space after all. Hollywood has <laughs> enough stories about that. <laughs> and it's soon to have quite a few more from the sounds of. It could be, uh, could be something could be. quite interesting, I guess. Yeah, going from kind of, yeah, so going out there for long enough that you've not just got these small, sc um, small scale psychological relationships of just uh, co-worker to co-worker, but there's actually enough time to have more personal experiences out there. That's, I assume that's something they're not, they won't have fully prepared for to an extent. Because one of the right. benefits of getting these tough people is that they tend to, part and practice of the kind of testing that they're doing in the past is the idea of kind of keeping to yourself, staying emotionally strong, also meaning not reaching out to other people. And the issue with that being that, well, the benefit of that being that you don't have these problems to do with extra relationships being formed. Well, I guess, obviously, if the selection process is, is changing, mm. I'm, I'm presuming that's not something they can necessarily test for. So I guess it will be uh, yeah. adapting to the situation as it happens. Although, as you mentioned, with the extra communication um, links nowadays with, with the missions mm. uh, and that, that far increased frequency of, of communication, not only with, obviously, the co-workers and uh, the team members, but with both the, the wider network of support team uh, back at base and potentially... Uh, even beyond that, um, I guess it's something that they'll uh, they'll get to eventually. Yeah, yeah. Towards the uh, beginning of your talk, you mentioned that I mean, me media and governments often portray astronauts as being these ideal figures who are like perfect superhero images, mm. and. In the real world, as we, you know, progress into a more practical world, I guess, what are some steps that we as a society could take to kind of eliminate this, you know, picture of perfection that we have towards astronauts, rather view them as, you know, people like you and I, who are, you know, as prone to making mistakes as can ever be. Hmm. I think that we've started down that kind of process of humanizing astronauts now that it's, it's become less of a political thing has you know the space race is is fairly come come and gone by this point and we've approached kind of the sort of age where a lot of these astronauts are getting old and older and they're kind of they're producing personal accounts you've got biographies and whatnot from these people talking about their experiences and while these are still a, a little bit sanitized i think that it seems like over the next couple you know the last, next couple of uh, decades or so we'll be getting more and more accounts that show the much more human side to these people and as we get more and more pieces of research like this for example will gradually get more familiar with the idea that the perfect human being doesn't really exist 
there's just people who are brave enough and adaptable enough to live out there but still see some damage from it. Well, I have another question, which is slightly more on the creative side. But if you could be an astronaut, what would your top three virtues slash characteristics be? <laughs> hmm. Are we going to go for sci-fi astronauts here or actual astronauts? Because there's one of those that I would know more about the, uh, the practices of than the other. You're free to choose either way. I mean, may maybe a bit more realistic would be better, but yeah. if you want to go for sci-fi, just go for it. <laughs> well, I, I definitely see myself as being one of the sorts to take a lot of pictures. Like the the, the stories that it tells of taking uh, learning photography out there and being able to really get connected with people on Earth from a distance, those were very nice stories they were telling. In terms of, I'd, I'd, I'd personally try and stick to my research for the most part. Stick to the routine, stick to the research, but with, with enough time to take pictures of space as you go. So I guess those is that is, is that almost three virtues that I've counted there. <laughs> I reckon I reckon you can yeah. concentrate. Yeah, those it's it's three mashed together. <laughs> Thank you. That was really well phrased. <laughs> I'm glad someone thought that it was. Thank you. Seeing as we don't have too many other questions, I'd like hmm. to take a a short amount of your time to kind of change tack a little bit. Uh, obviously, as a as a University of Birmingham graduate now. Uh, you, you're heading on into uh, a PhD study Made and you're doing so at perhaps one of the most difficult times um, that it, certainly in our lifetimes. Mm. How are you finding um, what is quite a large change? Not only are you uh, perhaps more distant from your friends that you've maybe spent the last three or four mm. years with, you're also starting work with a new group of people that perhaps you've never met before. How are you coping with this personally? It's, it's an interesting situation. At the moment, it's hard to comment a huge amount because I'm still, there's still this kind of limbo situation where term in Oxford hasn't started yet. We're, we're in fresh as fresh as week. So next week we actually get introduced to colleges, get to know people. I've gotten to know my housemates quite a bit at the moment. They're currently out to, to a couple of thrift shops to buy some nice paintings for the house. But uh, we're, we're getting along for the most part. So there's, there's still opportunities to get to socialize with people. To an extent, being in a new place is kind of an opportunity to meet a lot of new people, see a lot of faces, even if there are still restrictions that mean you can't meet everyone at once. In terms of going to work, I've met my supervisor so far for a grand total of around 15 minutes. So it'll be good to actually see him in person at some point or another. It seems like the policy is going to be that the majority of the work is going to be remote as you'd expect but most of the supervisors within the university have already started reaching out saying that they want to have a drink have a conversation really get talking so even though it's it's fairly distant the amount of remote communication that's going on means that everything's still quite well connected i'd say there's still ways you can keep in touch with people even if you are locked inside and kind of on that note um we're, we're hoping to obviously welcome all the new freshers to, to AstroSoc uh, this coming week uh, and, and to really help envelop them in, in our sense of community that we have. Hmm. Um, do you have any sort of tips for, for these freshers that not only are a starting university, uh, but are trying to make their own way, their own friendships, uh, etc.? Um, hmm. Have you got any points that, that you might be able to share with them who, who may be watching this video live or perhaps are going to come and view it? Uh, well, like, uh, if you are watching, hi. <laughs> but at this, um, I, I could give some more generic tips, but I'm sure that most people who are listening already have already heard the advice of, you know, join a society, join AstroSoc, obviously, it's the best one. <laughs> but more specifically, I, I guess the best piece of advice that could be given that I've not seen in many other places is that you don't need to worry about the advice too much. As long as you have a good net, you know, you actually go out and meet people and you're remaining social, you don't, you're, you're going to mostly find your way relatively easily. You, you kind of find your place, right? Everyone finds a couple of societies that they feel welcome in. They find social groups that they get to know. And it kind of almost happens organically for the most part. And I think a lot of people come into university wondering about the kind of steps they have to make, the actions they have to take to kind of fit into that hole. And before they've even started to look at their list of advice, like be sure to start with a uh, fancy opening line when you meet someone, they've, they've already met a group of friends and they've kind of started to feel at home. I think that is uh, some, some really stellar advice there. Yes, I, I would agree entirely. Mm. Thank you, Dan. Um, 
without anything else to to kind of discuss uh, i think we'll have a look at wrapping this session up um okay. before we before we kind of fully uh, terminate this video i'd like to say thank you uh, both to dan and also to all of our other lecturers who have joined us as part of this quarantine series it's been great to have you all along um to to kind of help out with this to spread the word uh, and to really hope help bolster people's spirits give them something to do um and the like mm. i'd also like to say uh, a massive thank you to the rest of the astrosoc committee uh, for their support in the background helping run all of this uh, be that from reaching out to academics and and uh, past members of, of committees and friends of committees who have helped actually put on these talks and actually physically organising that to the people that have been advertising all of this uh, on the society's behalf and to those who have been helping run the tech support, the streaming services, uh, all the rest of it. Um, you know, they've been a really, really big part in in helping bring this to you. So thank you to everybody. Um, and yes. We hope that you'll come and join us on some of our, our uh, events coming up this this week and in the in the coming weeks. Uh, and if you would like to hear from Dan again, then please uh, make sure you tune in for his talk during uh, World Science, World Space Week. Don't be Cheers, a stranger. Guys. Cheers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan, and goodbye. <laughs>